welcome back. Uh, thank you for rejoining us for the second part of the session uh, for security, privacy, and innovation, reshaping law for the AI era. Uh, I'm Kristen Ozinga, a professor at University of Richmond School of Law. Uh, I'm moderating this fantastic panel, uh, which is gonna add some further insight to the debate positions that we heard uh, from Judge Michelle, Director Yanku, and uh, Mr. Jones, uh, and talk more about the practical impacts that innovation uh, in AI and other emerging technologies uh, are raising in today's uh, patent eligible subject matter uh, confusion. Uh, so it just briefly, as we heard earlier, patent eligible subject matter is very important uh, for a lot of different industries today. Uh, it's it's a, a, an area with a high level of innovation and investment, but there's some disagreement about whether or not the patent eligible subject matter rules of today are able to address and handle artificial intelligence uh, and whether or not patent eligible subject matter needs to be reformed and by whom. Uh, and in particular, does it need to be specially tweaked to fix artificial intelligence? Uh, so, so after hearing about all of those things, what we've done now is we've gathered this panel of experts, an all-star panel, I'm quite excited, uh, to expand on the comments that were raised uh, in the earlier debate and provide some on the ground practical implement uh, practical implications of the, the, the current issues surrounding patent eligibility. So I'm gonna briefly introduce our panelists uh, and then let them speak, give some opening remarks, and then I'm going to go ahead uh, and uh, moderate a discussion, throwing some maybe tough questions at each of our panelists. Uh, but before I do that, let me quickly give you a, a brief note on the CLE, uh, very similar to what Professor Kediji said. So uh, again, this event comprising both panels of the session has been approved for two credit hours uh, in the area of professional practice for New York State CLE credit. Uh, later on during the program, we will pause and I will read aloud a CLE course code or codes. And so those seeking CLE credit will need to record the code or codes and submit them on the attorney affirmation form. Uh, attendees should have received a link to the attorney affirmation form in their reminder email and the form will be sent again after the event is over. Uh, the event is appropriate for both newly admitted and experienced attorneys. And again, that code will come up later. So um, our fine panelists today include uh, Drew Hirschfeld, who is performing the functions and duties of the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the US Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, Laura Sheridan, Google Senior Patent Counsel and Head of Patent Policy. Hans Sauer, Deputy General Counsel and VP for Intellectual Property at the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, and Ryan Abbott, Professor of Law and Health Sciences at the University of Surrey School of Law. So as I mentioned, I'm going to begin by asking each of the, the panelists to talk for just a couple minutes uh, to provide your own perspectives on the patent eligibility doctrine and debate. What are, what are the problems as you see them, and in particular for emerging technologies like IAI? So let me go ahead and start with uh, Drew Hirschfeld. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me here uh, today. First of all, I want to say I really enjoyed the, the previous panel. I thought that was a, an excellent discussion, um, and I'm looking forward to sharing my thoughts on this. I'd like to start off by um, uh, saying I really appreciate the efforts of, of that are being taken for this conference and also for the uh, National Security Commission on AI to highlight uh, this particular issue because uh, protection of artificial intelligence and having the right uh, approach to artificial intelligence, the right national strategy, in my opinion, is absolutely critically important, and I applaud all efforts uh, to have the, the conversation. Um, I, I, uh, we're going to struggle having this conversation in two minutes here, so I'm just going to highlight that I'm really looking forward to talking about some practical impacts. I've been at the USPTO a long time as an examiner uh, all the way up to this position, so for over 27 years, and I've seen all the permutations and changes in subject matter eligibility, so I'm really looking forward to, to sharing uh, some of those thoughts. Let me just start by saying, in my mind, um, I see this uh, uh, as on multiple fronts. We need to have the right lines of uh, what we are issuing patents for, uh, and I know subject matter eligibility is a huge part of this, so we need to write, have the right lines for subject matter eligibility that are clear, uh, that people can understand uh, and, and are predictable. And we also need to have uh, a process that's efficient. Uh, and, and I'm happy to get into that uh, in some of the discussions, of, again, of 
been overseeing examiners for a long time. I've been an examiner and, and love to share my thoughts about the efficiency or rather the lack of efficiency uh, as I see it that, that is occurring now. And I'll just add one other word. You heard in the earlier panel a lot of discussion about uncertainty. Um, in my opinion, uh, there is still a great deal of uncertainty. I do think the USPTO uh, and our guidelines that we issued in 2019 on subject matter eligibility have helped in areas like artificial intelligence and helped examiners make the right call. But in the big scheme, uh, I certainly do think that the lines are blurry, there is uncertainty, and uh, I believe we can all do better uh, on this. So I'll end my remarks there, and, and I'm looking forward to the questions. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, Laura Sheridan. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, first, I'm very glad to be on this panel uh, and to participate in this really important conversation. Um, my position is that you know, the current patent eligibility doctrine is supportive of the expansion of innovation in the US and emerging, in emerging technologies, particularly in AI. There has been so much positive activity across the private and the public sectors to foster AI research and make sure the resources to conduct the research are being made available to as large of an audience uh, as possible. And the strategy presented by the NSCAI is a really important aspect of this. And we welcomed the commission's work and supported its overall findings in the final report. But we do disagree with the chapter on IP and the position that the IP system in the US is standing in the way of AI development. And as one of the biggest innovators in AI technology, we actually find the opposite to be true. Um, we believe the US IP system as it stands to be balanced in a way that's allowed AI development to thrive uh, and that any disruption of the balance would actually harm innovation in emerging technologies and not help it. The patent law in particular, which we'll talk about a lot today, is um, particularly striking the right balance to protect what Dave mentioned, which are technological advances, while making sure that you know, abstract ideas aren't hindering follow-on innovation. And from everything we've seen, patenting in AI is actually flourishing in spite of what the report says. If you look at a IEEE study, um, which shows that um, from the period of 2008 to 2018, the PTO actually granted um, nearly five times as many AI-related patents. And of those um, patents, 70% of which were granted to US um, assignees. Um, the US PTO actually performed a similar study um, recently and reached similar conclusions to the IEEE one. Um, and this is all consistent with our own experience as one of the leading innovators and also one of the leading patent filers in AI. So our hope um, is that the balance in the IP system overall um, in patent eligibility law in particular will be maintained so that the patent law does not actually hamper the investment and the energy that's being put into AI research and development nationwide. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Hans Sauer. Well, um, hello. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this incredible panel. I, um, I work for the biotechnology industry organization, so I did not fully expect to be invited to an event as interesting as this, especially to have an opportunity to address you all. Um, for me, it's good evening. I am sending you greetings from Geneva where I have spent the week meeting uh, country delegations and lots of really interesting people on the subject of uh, a global waiver of intellectual property in the context of trips. But, and I have, don't worry, no intention of hijacking this conversation into something that's very much been occupying our minds. Uh, but I do wanna share how, how struck I was all week in meetings by the intensity and the closeness by which uh, the US patent system and the decisions of the patent office and others in the administration, by the closeness by which, with which uh, these developments are being watched and uh, by the um, degree to which I think other countries not only take note and have a detailed understanding of IP developments and patent law developments in the United States, but also uh, the degree to which so many countries look to the US for leadership, right? And uh, in the sense that if there are changes in US patent law, um, or if there are developments in US patent law that diverge from internationally established best practices, 
those are being very, very closely noticed and very well understood by other countries. Uh, so this is a relatively big deal uh, in an in international context. If, for example, there's an area of the law that is producing systematically different outcomes in the United States compared to uh, outcomes that are produced in the patent examining systems, for example, of other developing uh, developed countries with whom we trade and compete. Right? I, I, uh, and I, I cannot opine on whether AI, because it's not my field really, whether AI is such a field, right? whether um, that patents are systematically being denied for AI related inventions uh, that, are, that are patentable and remain patentable in other countries. I can tell you that such a state of affair exists in areas of biotechnology, where there's a, a pretty big divergence uh, in some areas of biotechnology that are not patentable in the United States and that remain patentable in other countries. But that, uh, I think, is, is widely noticed. It is perplexing. It does raise questions for US competitiveness and the flow of capital. Uh, but in biotech, we have lived with such a disparate state of affairs. Um, I, I would also note, but as an introductory comment, that I was again reminded here in Geneva, talking to people at WIPO and from other countries, that our grappling with Section 101 in the US, right, all the rivers of ink that have been spilled by scholars and commentators on the question, right, the myriad conferences that uh, we're having and the continuing debate. That's a debate and that's a problem. And it's a set of disputes in the United States that other countries just don't have. But right? this problem and our, our, our um, I think the intensity with which we grapple with this in the United States does not exist elsewhere. And that should teach us something, right? Are other countries just smarter, right? Or uh, why is it that this is such a problem for us and who's created this problem and other countries seem to be doing okay. I look forward to uh, like the comments of you all who are much better informed about AI uh, to teach me about how other countries are dealing with this, why our system is different and whether that's good or bad. But I can tell you that it really makes a difference internationally and for the way other countries might position themselves and for the way other countries might uh, might suspect that they um, they can leverage the state of affairs for their own economic development and competitive advantage. Thank you. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Ryan Abbott with his opening remarks. Well, thank you. And it's a real honor to be here speaking with all of you today. I was struck by one of the questions on the last panel, which was, what's the difference between software and AI in this space? And it's kind of remarkable that we in almost all of these discussions or the ones going on at US PTO or UK IPO or WIPO or are still struggling with very basic definitional issues about you know, the interaction of AI and IP law. Although perhaps even more strangely, we still don't have a real definition for AI, even as the EU is publishing new AI regulations, although they have their definition. But uh, from my perspective, the difference is how disruptive AI is going to be compared with prior software. And less about patent, software patents for me, you know, but one of the exciting ways I think it's going to be disruptive is AI generating intellectual property. And AI has been doing that for a long time, making new music and art for decades. It's just not done it very well. But we're getting technologically close to the point at which AI can make music people want to listen to or art that people want to buy. And that's going to have a major commercial impact and I think be highly disruptive to IP law and the way we protect things. And in at least some cases, AI is generating patentable output under circumstances in which you don't have a traditional human inventor. You know, that isn't, and so there's a series of legal test cases I'm involved with going on right now. Um, in some jurisdictions, those applications have been denied and in some they've been granted for protections of an AI generated invention. That's not traditional subject matter eligibility, but it is essentially deciding that a category of invention should be unpatentable on the basis of a formalities issue or because they lack a traditional human inventor. 
And whether or not we choose to protect those sorts of inventions is, I agree with the NSCAI, a, a significant matter of industrial policy. And I think similar to the way that the U.S. has handled biotechnology innovations and, for example, the Supreme Court case of Diamond v. Chakrabarty, which held a genetically modified organism could be protected and is widely credited with, you know, encouraging investment in biotech. And I think we're at a point now where we should be discussing whether or not we want to protect AI generated inventions. And this has the same potential to generate investment in AI and to encourage the use of AI in socially beneficial sorts of ways. So that in 10 years, when COVID-25 comes along, Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson may go to sophisticated AIs to sequence those pathogens, match them to antibodies, and that AI comes to play a major role in the way that we do research and development. Fantastic. I'm, although I'm a little horrified at COVID-25, but uh, fantastic otherwise. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to move into some questions. Um, I'm going to ask you just one really quick question, uh, Mr. Hirschfeld, uh, that came from a, a question from the previous panel, which is, at the patent office, are AI inventions examined for harm? That they may cause to the public or to others, and and I, I assume for you, uh, with your years of experience of examining, you can answer that pretty quickly. I can, um, and and you said you said harm. Uh, is that what your question was? Yeah. So yep. so we we do not we we look at uh, we do not look at harm or or the uh, prospective outcomes, so to speak. We we really see is it you know look at the statues. Is it new, non obvious, useful? Um, but none of the and, and of course eligible, but none of those uh, include harm to that. Great, great. We do, we do have a number of non-lawyers and non-patent experts in the audience today, so we want to make sure that we're, we're giving uh, them some full information. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask you, though, as long as you're unmuted, is you mentioned the, the 2019 guidelines and, and the, the, that there's still a lot of uncertainty. So uh, aside from administering 101 through the examination process, do you see any other role or a bigger role for the patent office in eliminating some of this uncertainty that you see? Sure. Well, I, 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 I think that there's a lot of roles that we can play. Um, first of all, let me, let me point out that um, to get a scope on, on the size of what we're talking about, uh, currently about just under 20%, about 18 or 19% of all applications have some form of AI in them. It's quite quite remarkable, and it's growing and growing. Um, to your question about what we can do, obviously uh, we mentioned the guidelines, and of course we need clear guidelines uh, that are being watched, uh, not only by examiners, of course, but but by the general public, and to Hans's point, uh, other countries as well. But there's a lot we can do uh, elsewhere. We've done a number of studies um, on AI. We currently have right now a request for comments from the public to gather information about uh, uh, impacts uh, to them about current uh, 101 jurisprudence. And we're, we're going to gather this information and, and help uh, spur the public debate. So there's a lot of ways we can be helpful to try to pull information and education in and really help conversations like this uh, take place. I also wanted to mention um, we've been recently requested by Congress to try a pilot program where we defer uh, examination of subject matter eligibility while the other statutes uh, get examined. And that is something that's very different from what we've ever done at the USPTO. We've always looked at all the statutes at once. Uh, and we are going to pilot this. We're in the process of, uh, I'm hoping this month, uh, you will, we'll have a notice that we're going to come out and pilot this. And I uh, using this as an answer to your question, because I think this is something we can do to try a new process to see if it is more effective. Um, the premise, by the way, for those of you that aren't aware, is if you defer subject matter eligibility um, decisions and discussion, that maybe they become moot. Um, and that hopefully makes the system more efficient. Um, again, I'm not saying I agree or disagree. In my opinion, it's going to depend on the situation, uh, but at least we're going to pilot that and see what situations it might be helpful in. Great. That's, that's super interesting. Thank you. Um, so a question for uh, Laura Sheridan. You mentioned that there's, there's tons of AI research going on, lots of uh, AI innovation, and that maybe patent eligible subject matter isn't, uh, and the uncertainty around it maybe is or isn't creating any sort of barriers. Um, do you see any other challenges to innovation in AI that, that either patent related or otherwise is 
or or really is everything just going swimmingly and AI research just is on point? No, it's a, it's a great question. And I think, you know, there, there's always room to improve. Um, and I think on patents specifically, one of the biggest challenges we see is making sure the examining core is staying up to date on all the latest AI developments um, so that they can properly analyze AI related inventions. Um, and I think when this isn't the case, we see issues playing out in one of two different problematic ways. And, and one way um, this can play out is if the examiner isn't fully understanding um, the technological advancement that's being described and claimed, um, the patent applicant could actually have difficulty getting a deserving patent. And I think that can result in lengthy prosecution. It can result in the need for appeal or for under-resourced applicants, it could even result in you know, abandonment of that um, patent application. Uh, but another way that it can play out is through the grant of an undeserving patent um, in the event that maybe the examiner isn't aware that what they're seeing is, is not new or non-obvious or that it doesn't otherwise satisfy you know, sections 101 and 112. And this can really be exacerbated by inventions that are claiming an application of AI, um, where maybe the examiner is an expert in that area of application, but not an expert in the underlying um, AI technology. So, what we've encouraged to the PTO in a previous um, comment cycle on AI um, is just having a robust technical training program for examiners, um, for anybody who is examining an AI-related invention. So not just those who are really looking at you know, fundamental deep learning technology, but those who are looking at these applications. Um, and when we were thinking this through, it, it stood out to us that this issue isn't really new. It's come up um, years ago, back in 2003, the FTC raised you know, a similar issue also in the context of emerging technologies that you know, this grant of an upstream patent can really hinder downstream innovation. Um, and so that's exactly what we're trying to do now with AI is just avoiding anything that's hindering innovation. Um, and so in our view, this is, this is a pressing issue. It's worth further attention. And I think the PTO has some recent tooling that's helping applications get routed to the right examiners maybe that you know, is also a good way to facilitate identifying who would be a good candidate for the training. And I see Drew smiling, maybe it's a good idea. <laughs> uh, fantastic, thanks. Um, okay, so, so moving to Hans, I'm just moving around the room here today. Um, so you mentioned that in the biotech field, where you are an expert, um, there's some divergence among the various countries on patent eligible subject matter. Um, one of the questions that came up in the earlier panel with, with Judge Michelle and um, uh, Director Yanku and, and Mr. Jones was whether or not these, these differences in coverage based on patent eligible subject matter might lead to problems with TRIPS. Do you have anything based on your expertise of, oh, I'm making you blow out your cheeks, this can't be good. Um, <laughs> do you, do you, based on your expertise in the bio field, do you, do you have any thoughts on, on TRIPS and maybe how divergent patent eligible subject matter might be a problem for AI. Oh, okay, well, that's a, well, thank you for this loaded question. Um, okay, a, a thought on TRIPS. Well, so TRIPS is this funny creature. Um, it, is, it is very often talked about, but, and uh, I, I think it's very important as a, a frame of reference for both like plurilateral, plurilateral discussions conversations uh, with colleagues in other countries, delegations of governments of other countries. But in reality, TRIPS is this thing that uh, every now and then it comes up in conversation, but it really only matters when it gets enforced and it doesn't get enforced all that often, right? So a country, and we see plenty of examples where countries act in ways that are arguably TRIPS incompliant and nothing happens, right? And the the attitude is basically, what's going to happen, right? Is the government of something, some other country going to drag me into, into a WTO dispute resolution proceeding because I'm doing something to my patent laws that creates systematically different outcomes and stands in the way of trade? So um, I don't want to be dismissive of TRIPS, but it sets a very important framework. But to my mind, uh, it is not a very good... Uh, working text, if you will, to which you can turn and decide the lawfulness of uh, regulation, legislation, or even examination practices, right? Because again, 
it all depends on how enforceable it really is. Um, I think what's what's much more helpful is is to as you're doing is to ask the question of how does it fit into internationally prevailing best practices? Are there divergences, and how do companies react to uh, to an instance where they find themselves being denied patents in important jurisdictions and markets, uh, but receiving patents in others? So, for example, why right, people have mused. Uh, to take a, a very clear example, let's say the patentability of uh, pharmaceutical substances or industrial enzymes, as it may be, that are first discovered in natural source materials and that are claimed in the form of purified and rich preparations in patent applications. But this provided that you can show industrial applicability and a distinction over the prior art is not a problem for patenting in other countries, including important countries like China, but it is a very clear bar to patentability in the United States, right? So if I find a new enzyme in a bacterium that I discovered in some sulfur rich acidic hot spring somewhere, and because of the circumstances under which the enzyme functions in nature, I can tell that it has interesting industrial applications under similar like high pressure, high temperature, applications in industrial settings, that kind of thing used to be patentable in the United States if claimed in the form of an enriched or purified preparation. It is patentable in China, but no longer patentable in the US. Right? So, so companies will, of course, wonder, what does it mean if I'm in that field of endeavor? If I want to go, say, to the Chinese market as an American company, right, I will have to respect patents. Um, in China, right? And I will have to respect the patents of my competitors who are in a similar field. Whereas when these competitors come to the US market, they encounter much less of a patent obstacle. It's a free for all, at least in that pocket of technology, right? How that cuts is, is something that I, I can't say, I can't say I fully, we've all fully understood this, right? But it, it does raise questions and it certainly invites notionally uh, copyists into the United States right, when it didn't do before and the situation in China is different because they do expect that patents on these things be protected. So I, I think that vein of conversation is much more um, uh, productive in a way to, to gauge the, the implications for competitiveness and the willingness to invest. If AI is in a similar situation, I assume that similar questions come up. So, so in our, in biotech, right, the areas that are affected are, I gave you the example of naturally occurring substances that are claimed uh, in the form of preparations. Uh, another example that we all know is the area of diagnostic technology, right, which uh, does produce disparate outcomes in Europe uh, and in Asian jurisdictions compared to the United States. Um, and uh, we do know it drives behavior and investment behavior uh, in diagnostics, for example. Uh, I think there are indications why that more attention is being paid to either technologies that can be kept confidential. Companies always took advantage of trade secrets. I think they are more serious uh, in instances where they, they fear about the patent eligibility of their inventions about non-disclosure. Uh, it also drives investment in the sense that maybe diagnostic companies feel they're better off spending money on, if you will, diagnostic tools, right? The instruments, the reagents or kits, rather than what they really invented. And that is the test itself, right? The discovery of the correlation of a, a natural substance that they can detect with what it really means for diagnostic or prognostic purposes. Why well, I have talked to companies who said, well, we can still get patents, but if we can, it usually comes at great expense of claim scope. Um, but, and it, it does make them uh, act differently in terms of disclosure, as well as in, in the kinds of things that they do seek to patent and in the way they interact with both competitors and potential partners. 
Great, thanks. Um, okay, so so uh, Ryan Abbott, um, you I know you briefly mentioned uh, your patent applications, the Dabas patent applications, in your introductory remarks, but. Um, can you explain for people who maybe are, are tuned in but not quite up on what's going on there, what's going on there? And then also there's there's a question already from the audience about the, the Dabas patent. Um, do you think there would be an inventorship challenge if AI was not identified as the inventor? Uh, so uh, however you wanna go forward with those uh, thoughts. Sure, and interrupt me if I talk too long, but uh, you know, essentially, we had an AI that made two inventions in a manner in which, in our opinion, under at least US and UK patent law, no person would traditionally qualify as an inventor. And I could spend an hour talking about why that is, so I won't, but you could take my word for it at that, at just for present purposes. N not the first time someone has claimed to have had this happen. A number of people have claimed that this has happened over the day ages. And, and I interviewed some of them for research purposes. And essentially they said, well, our attorneys just said, list yourself as an inventor. There's no requirement to list an AI or anything. And, you know, no one's going to think twice about it. And that is a potential solution. But then you get into litigation and you're deposing the inventor of this. And they say, oh, well, I didn't really do much. This just came out of an AI. And they said, put my name on it. And so, you know, that works until there's a problem. What to do about an AI that makes patentable output without a traditional human inventor really was an issue without a lot of case law a few years ago. Uh, many patent laws around the world use human-centric sorts of terms around inventors, and there is case law, including in the U.S., stating that an inventor has to be a natural person. But this has always been in the context of corporate inventorship or corporate-like entities, and there's a principled reason you wouldn't want a company to be an inventor, namely that you would exclude human inventors from being listed and acknowledged, and companies literally act through people. You know, AI, at least in this context, doesn't act through people, and so you wouldn't be excluding someone. And if you don't have that traditional inventor, um, can you even get a patent? That's the main commercial issue we were looking at solving with these cases. We filed them in 17 jurisdictions. They passed substantive patent examination. They were rejected in the US, UK, Europe, Germany, and Australia on, well, they were denied on the basis of a non-compliance with listing a, a natural person as an inventor. All of those denials are under appeal in the US. There was recently a rejection by the Eastern District of Virginia last month that's just been appealed to the federal circuit. It was just rejected from the UK Court of Appeal, although the court split on that with Lord Justice Burse holding that the patent office didn't have to list an AI as an inventor, but an AI could invent for purposes of patent law, and there's no bar to getting a patent on that sort of thing. In July, we had a patent issued in South Africa with the AI listed as the inventor and the AI's owner listed as the patent owner. And three days later, a federal court in Australia held that that should be the approach taken by IP Australia, although that's under appeal as well. And Essentially, the argument is, you know, patents traditionally have to have inventors, although there are some jurisdictions where maybe that's a little different. Israel, for example, does not require an inventor to be listed. Uh, but as we don't have a human one and the AI functionally invented, we listed the AI as the inventor. No one argued that the AI should own a patent, so the AI's owner would own a patent, and this would encourage people to be investing in AI that generates socially valuable output and encouraging people to make use and develop that sort of AI. Um, and so there is at the moment a split of authority on how patent law should treat something like this, whether you should be able to get a patent at all, what would be the inventor or who, or if there would be an inventor at all, and how entitlement would work to that. And there have also been recently an Indian parliamentary consultation suggesting that parliament should change the law in India to explicitly allow this. And last month, the president of South Korea publicly stated that these sorts of inventions should get patent protection. Um, so I think it's an area in which the law and policy is moving quickly. Great. So I'm going to throw a, a quick question right back at you. Uh, in the earlier panel, uh, one of the things that, that was brought up a couple of times is that the, the patent law, at least here in the United States, you know, dates back to Jefferson or possibly 1952. Um, in, in where these things were never contemplated. So when, when you're talking about some of this ideas about human centric and things like that, is, is this something where you would argue that maybe the law needs to be updated for the modern time? 
Well, it's our position, at least, that this is something that the law should already accommodate. I don't I think anyone has argued in any jurisdiction that people were trying to exclude AI generated inventions when these laws were passed, you know, including Section 103, which is from 1952. But, you know, there's two kind of approaches to that. There's a, a narrow statutory interpretation approach you could take, which is, you know, an individual means a natural person, although it doesn't always. Um, or there's a purposive approach, which is namely that, you know, the Patent Act was designed to encourage technological progress and generating socially valuable activities, and that this is exactly the sort of activity that patent law was meant to accommodate. And reading the law with that purpose in mind, there is no principled reason that an AI couldn't invent something and that someone couldn't get a patent on that sort of thing. And, and that is the approach that the Australian court took. It's not yet the approach that the U.S. courts have taken. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, if U.S. courts do determine that we're not going to protect this sort of thing, then the solution may be a legislative one. Great. Um, so I'm going to throw another question back to uh, Laura Sheridan. One of the things that Hans mentioned uh, in his discussion was was trade secrets or possibly claiming something different than the invention in order to have a patent. So so a question for you is, you know, how does Google decide whether to go patents versus trade secrets or are, are there decisions made about what avenue what what area of the invention to patent in order to get something that's patent eligible versus something that might not be? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And this, this does keep coming up, especially in terms of, you know, of course, the interest in having as much information out there as possible, especially in an area like AI, where we're all, you know, innovating on top of one another's innovations. And I think the short answer here is that patent eligibility um, does not affect our decision on whether to keep something secret. Um, the decision to keep technology secret is the gating question. Um, it's, a, it's the first question that's asked. Um, it's answered by the business um, and it's based on sort of product driven inquiries based on the nature of the technology and whether that's something you're comfortable with disclosure of. Um, so it's, it's not something that's happening sort of at a you know, patent versus keep it secret um, question. It's, it's simply, should we keep this secret? Um, and then if the decision is made to, to not keep the technology secret, it becomes a patent decision. Um, and, and at that point, you know, there can be questions of if eligibility would be an issue that can arise and it adds context um, more often with us, not, not in the AI context. But um, if, if the decision is, you know, there could be eligibility problems here um, in that situation where we've already decided we're comfortable with disclosure, we would actually be likely to publish it. Um, in some way that creates prior art that at least would um, get more information out there rather than um, risking someone else um, trying to cover it themselves. So um, we don't default to trade secrets um, for patent eligibility reasons. Um, the question whether to keep it secret, it's, it's independent and we ask it first. Great, thank you. Um, so, so Drew Hirschfeld, um, so the challenges that come up when examining artificial intelligence applications. Um, obviously patent eligible subject matter is one of them. Uh, Laura identified when she was talking about getting the apps to the right types of examiners. What other sort of challenges do you see for artificial intelligence and in, in the examination by the patent office of these types of inventions? So a couple of thoughts. One, um, I'll reference, uh, Laura mentioned I was smiling when she talked about classification. That's because uh, we are using artificial intelligence to help us classify uh, patent applications to, to direct them to examiners. So we're, 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 we're users here as well as, as discussing the, the policies. Um, you know, I, I will just tell you that, that it, it's been a struggle over the many, many years dealing with subject matter eligibility and the many changes uh, that it has. And, and I'm 27 years now at, at PTO. And I can tell you that for a while, it seemed like every few years we're retraining examiners on new ways to apply a statute that hasn't changed at all uh, during this time. And I will say that, that the, the analysis under 101, under subject matter eligibility has, has continued to evolve, again, notwithstanding the statute staying exactly the same, but it's continued to evolve to be 
more complicated um, as we go, right? And, and maybe it's not a, a perfect straight line, uh, but certainly over the course of, I'll say, my career, the analysis has, has become infinitely more complicated for examiners. Um, a challenge we face at the PTO is training, retraining. Um, examiners are smart. They're looking at case law. They see a case. They, they think, does that apply to me, right? I think that's why I was getting into the lines being unclear. So, so we are doing a lot more training on 101 um, than I could have ever imagined we would do. And, and we're doing that repetitively. And the importance of this is, is on many levels. One, um, there has been times where I will tell you that almost throughout all management at PTO, we started saying, we need, to, we need to train on the other statutes, right? We're so focused on 101 because it's been so evolving uh, that, that we haven't, you just, there's only so much training you can do, right? While you're on, on production systems. And it was, it really, it was a, a conscious effort to try to remember to train on the, on the prior art statutes, uh, which are vitally important. Remember to train examiners how to search because there's so much focus on 101. So I think these ha have been uh, some big problems. And I, 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 I appreciate that the discussion today is on the, the practical impacts. And I, I just wanna share one practical impact that in some ways I, I feel bad addressing it, badly addressing it because I don't wanna lose focus of the big picture because to me, this is the, the law a, a, around artificial intelligence. And, and again, subject matter eligibility playing a key part in that to me is mostly, and most importantly about investment, uh, about what it says in the big picture. And so when I'm talking about PTO, I understand that, that, it's, that, that, that there's much more bigger um, issues at, at play. And by the way, to get to Hans's point, um, we are being watched internationally. Um, and I can tell you that, that I have many bilateral meetings and, and I had even four uh, this week with, with other countries and, and artificial intelligence comes up routinely in these meetings and people wanna know uh, what we're doing. But anyway, back to my point about some of the practical impacts. Um, as subject matter eligibility has gotten more confusing, and I'll just say after Alice, we saw a huge uptick in rejections in artificial intelligence applications. We spent a lot of time creating guidelines. We saw some of that come back down. We had to train again on that. But I, I, I want to just share with you all that ex patent examiners are on a production system. Uh, they have a, that, which means they have a certain amount of time to do their examination. And it would be real easy to say, as subject matter eligibility has gotten more confusing, just give more time for them to do this, right? And which we have quite frankly done over the years. Um, but I just wanna share the cost of giving every examiner one hour of time in each of their examinations. Uh, that would take a thousand examiners to be hired in a single year so that we wouldn't have a, a pendency fall off. So in other words, in order to keep the same pace of examining applications out and making decisions, we would have to hire a thousand examiners, uh, which is well over a hundred thousand uh, dollars, a hundred million dollars rather, uh, to keep the same pace just to give a single hour of this. So, so we feel when we have to uh, adjust and continually adjust, uh, that has real consequences for our ability to process cases timely, um, hiring examiners, et cetera. So anyway, I just wanted to share that, but, uh, but it is literally, I will tell you from my perspective at PTO, um, it, the, the moving goalpost, so to speak, of 101 uh, has been really a challenge over the many, many years to, to keep our people up to date. And the, and, and the issue is, is it's the bleed into other technologies. Like I actually feel right now, if you ask me right now, are we handling you know, current AI applications well, I think we're doing it as well as we can uh, under the law, I think we're doing it well, but what worries me is what will AI be tomorrow, right? It's not so much what it is now, it's what it is tomorrow and, and will we be prepared for that? And I think the lines are, are not clear enough to have the confidence that we will be prepared for that. Great, thanks. I, I, I yeah. see that Hans has un unmuted himself. So I think he might, do you have a response to that? Well, I, I, I would like to add to it, but I, uh, because, you know, the question of, okay, what, what could be, what's the practical implication that's actually happening or that people worry about, I think it's very relevant. So if I could, could add like some perspectives that I'm hearing from our own member companies who are in the biotech space, but uh, who are increasingly using AI as, as a tool in their own work and an important one that will only grow uh, before, I do that though. I, I do want to give a shout out to Ryan because I, I think Ryan uh, has uh, 
You know, the I think your initiative is is one of the most thought provoking things that has happened in patent law in a really long time. I find it fascinating. It raises such interesting questions. So here's a uh, a crude biotech or biopharmaceutical or biotech take on the question. One is what I see when I when we talk about this with our companies is I often see people in the life sciences when they think about AI putting together crude typology if you will, of what they even mean and understand when they talk about AI invention. So one, one way they think about it is, well, what if, what if like the improvement to the AI itself is claimed as the invention? And that I think is widely viewed as probably implicating 101, right? If you improve algorithms or processes for, for teaching an AI, um, well, that's one thing that uh, is, is easily understood as being connected to Section 101 if you see a patent on the improvement to the AI itself. Uh, I think what's often viewed a little differently is the inventions that are made with the assistance of AI, where the invention itself is a tangible thing or something that really shouldn't raise 101 questions and probably doesn't. Like, so if Davis invents a new beer can, the beer can is a beer can, and it should be compared to the prior art like any other thing. And if patent offices around the world or some patent offices reject the patent application, and they do so on, I think, Ryan, you called it pretty formalistic grounds, right? Because we require an inventor to sign, and, and an, AI, an AI can't sign, and an AI, 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 and, uh, an AI cannot assign rights or receive rights or exercise rights. So the inventor must be a human being and therefore we can't give a patent. That all that feels slightly beside the point, right? Because it sidesteps the real question of, well, why or why not should we give patents? And, and uh, parsing the words of patent statutes to, to say, oh, well, a human inventor was intended. Um, but because of assignment provisions or something isn't particularly satisfying. So it doesn't answer the real question. Um, a concern though is that um, if inventions that rely too heavily, and I don't mean this normatively, why right, just too heavily for purposes of this analysis on the assistance of AI, at some point that's gonna subtract from the ability to get a patent, right? If I'm an inventor and I got a lot of help from an AI, what did I really do enough as a human being to qualify as an inventor, right? And if I did not, then there shall be no patent. And as a pharmaceutical or other kind of biotech company, that becomes a real problem because what I invented with the help of the AI is let's say a drug molecule that requires the same amount of investment and intellectual property protection that was invented in the human mind or under the shower by an inventor, right? So, so I think there are real implications. AI as a tool is becoming re increasingly important in life sciences research and the fruits of that research, but if they're not patentable, um, uh, right, uh, I think we'll, we'll be much less likely to see investment uh, so it puts companies that access AI as a tool in their own work in a real bind. Um, and, and that's really something we should think about. But to my mind, the question of inventorship to us is the more immediately important one because that's where our ox is going to be gored versus, and, and the secondary question is, will we, if there are patentability problems in this space, continue to have access to quality AI tools to support our own work or not, right? because we don't invent the AIs, we access them, if Great. that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you, Hans, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm gonna pause at uh, this moment to put up the CLE code for those of you who need that. So the folks on the back end are gonna put this up. Okay, so the CLE code for those of you who are listening, R C L S four three seven six. So one more time. That's R is in Roger. C is in Cat. I am not good at alphabet. L is in something. S is in Sam. 
four, three, seven, six. So hopefully you all have that. Fantastic. Um, so uh, we have just about uh, eight or nine minutes left. If you have any questions, please do put them in the, the chat box for Q&A. Uh, so that we can get them to our speakers. There's there's some questions that have come through. Uh, Hans actually addressed a lot of them as far as uh, how, do, how do we assign with an AI? How do we have a signature with an AI? Some of the formalities that, that um, Ryan also talked about. Uh, so while we're uh, seeing if any other questions will come in, I, I guess there's a, a fairly interesting question that might be a little uh, outside the, the box here, but uh, maybe for uh, Drew Hirschfeld, uh, you mentioned that the um, patent office is using AI to uh, assign or, or route patent applications, could AI ever be used to do the patent examinations and decrease the need for those thousands of patent examiners? So um, in addition to using AI for classification, we're piloting and evaluating, we're on the earlier stages of this, uh, AI for helping the search, um, the examiner's search and going through prior art. Um, I don't, to, to answer the question, I don't see, uh, at least in my lifetime, uh, artificial intelligence getting to the point where it can replace uh, an examiner, because I think there's many uh, uh, decisions, human decisions that are needed to, to be made that AI is not capable yet. Um, but I, I certainly see AI as a tool to be able to facilitate the examiner's job. Um, I mentioned prior art, you know, by definition, the, the body of prior art references grows and grows and grows as, as time marches on. So that, and it becomes more, more international, quite frankly. So having some uh, a tools, uh, AI tools uh, to facilitate uh, and, and find prior art references and, and give the examiner a running start are really where we're at. And I think in the, in the at least the, the short term, um, Never, I never want to say never, but I, I think we're very far away from uh, where AI can replace an examiner. Great. Um, another question, and I, I'm going to send this one to Ryan, although Ryan looks like he unmuted anyway. So either he knows what question is coming or he wanted to talk more about that. You can talk about both, and that's fine. Uh, but do you you had mentioned that, that AI authors have already created music and, and novels, works of art. Um, is, is the concern about authorship for copyright purposes the same type of concern as serious is what the question is, as serious as the type of concern that's related to inventorship for patent law? Do you see those as the same sort of concerns or different? Um, I do see some overlap very briefly before getting to that first Hans thank you for the kind words on that you know we did these test cases for a number of reasons, one of which is it's hard to be a patent attorney and you know we hope that by filing these test cases, we've become marginally more interesting to the public than tax attorneys. And I, I do think that that has largely worked. So we are happy about that. Um, and on Director Hirschfeld's comment, I quite agree with that. We're a long way from replacing a patent examiner with an AI. But we do have AIs now that will automatically draft patent applications that aren't ready for filing, but it takes a lot of work out. And I think that in the next 10 years, Patent offices or some of them will get to the point where you do have an AI do a first pass of a search and a potential response and flagging some best practices. And so while it's not going to get rid of people, I do think it is going to have, you know, be both the cause and solution to the patent office getting overwhelmed with patent applications. As to the authorship point, um, you know, this is, I think, an interesting realm in which some jurisdictions diverge in their values and approaches to things. So if you're in continental Europe, copyright is very much about the moral rights of authors. You know, in the U.S., I think we've kind of jettisoned our romanticism and it's more about, you know, helping Marvel make more Avengers movies and Scarlett Johansson is expensive. And so it's a lot more about the utilitarianism of copyright law, about generating valuable sorts of works. And in that sense, you know, yes, under U.S. copyright office policy currently, although this is not a statute, you can't protect an AI generated work with copyright. And that creates a real disincentive if what we want is people using AI to make useful sorts of art and music and literature. The United Kingdom has a statute since 1988 that explicitly provides protection for that sort of thing. Uh, there hasn't been much litigation on that. Copyright is not registered in the UK and rarely is the existence of copyright at issue in litigation like that. But I do think, you know, copyright is more interesting than patent law in one respect, which is 
that I think in the next 10 years, it's going to have a really significant commercial impact in a way that AI and patents may not quite be at. I didn't say that that well, but I think you know what I meant. Great, thanks. Um, so we have just about five minutes left. I'm gonna ask Laura one last quick question, uh, if, if that's okay. Uh, that kind of plays off a little bit of what, what, what um, Ryan and Drew mentioned, which is, um, what, what do you see as the, the trend or the future of AI applications from Google's perspective going forward? If it, maybe they're not examining patents, but, but what, what directions do you see the future of AI happening for Google? I mean, I think it, it, and this sort of connects into the question of overall whether an AI can be an inventor or not. And I'll, I'll just say, no, we, we think it has to be a human. Um, but the reason for that is sort of what we see is the, the value of AI technology, which is you know, to what Hans called it, it's a tool. Uh, it's an extremely sophisticated and powerful tool that saves um, technologists you know, a, a ton of time. But at the end of the day, right now, um, it's being used as a tool. And, and so we see it as, you know, continuing to grow in a way that makes things easier for, um, for folks to figure out and, and layer in that human element of, you know, further experimentation, identifying what's really, you know, working well, validating those results, and then ultimately, you know, becoming the human inventor, we believe. But um, it, it will continue to develop in that way. But you know, I, I don't, I, I don't see a point at which the human is not, you know, deeply involved in understanding what those results are from this tool that is growing more powerful every day. It's, it still has that, that human element at the back end or at the front end or in the middle, but they're, they are very much involved still. And I can't imagine that not being the case. Um, Ryan no. has asked, oh, Hans has asked, hang on a second, Hans. Ryan asked very nicely if he can respond, but he has to respond very briefly because I'm going to have to wrap us up in just a moment. Very briefly, a team at Google published an, an article in Nature a few months ago saying that they developed an AI that could design new microchip plans in hours as opposed to months, and it outperformed human design chips in all key metrics. You know, taking that at face value, if Google licenses that to Intel and Intel has it churning out designs. You don't have someone who would traditionally qualify as an inventor, and yet you have an AI generating valuable intellectual property. So, you know, of course, there's people all over AI, but in the patent and copyright context, there may not be people who are authors or inventors as we've traditionally thought about those things. And Hans, do you have a very quick response? Uh, not, not a response, but a, a little add-on to uh, the, the comforting thought that while well, the role of AI in patent examination uh, it's probably going to increase, but, you know, we can kick the can down the road for 10 years, but I don't know if we shouldn't be starting to think about this because we might find ourselves 10 years from now looking at patent offices who more and more leverage AI and with implications, for example, for Section 103 examination, right? The, the, uh, the standpoint of how the patentability of an invention uh, uh, st stacks up is that of the ordinary skilled person, per, person of ordinary skill in the art that, uh, so in other words, if we all become bolstered and fortified by the use of AI, I think sooner or later we'll find ourselves with rejections in patent offices because an AI was able to make connections what, that wouldn't have been made by the human mind alone, right? So more and more things, are more and more things gonna become obvious? because AI is involved in the examination of these applications, right? Will we have a battle of AIs between applicants and examiners? Um, so, so I do think it has implications down the road. So while we're at the point of thinking about the future, which is gonna run rather sooner than we think anyway, this is probably something we should keep in mind, right? Maybe we can kick it down the road, but I do think it has implications for how we understand not just the making of inventions, but also their evaluation for patentability, whether it's 101, or more importantly, I think how they're measured against the prior art. I think AIs are going to supplant and supplement what a human might find obvious in ways that could be quite unexpected. 
Okay, well, I am so sorry to have to wrap up this panel. We are at our time and moving past it. Um, I uh, just want to thank all of the speakers again, Drew Hirschfeld, Hans Sauer, Ryan Abbott, Laura Sheridan. You guys were absolutely fantastic. This was so interesting. I hope the audience also enjoyed it. Uh, and thanks to the sponsors of this panel. Uh, really, really appreciate your perspectives.